you know, it turns out in the course of our reporting that we found out that Leonard was putting secret cameras into the karaoke machines in these, in these suites of these hotels and recording these orgies. And so, and, you know, we also found out from a very, very good source that China, China has control of that sexual compromat now, uh, or some of it. And so not only a, a story of misogyny in the Navy, and also, also a story of how all these officers involved in this story forgot all their training about being turned by a foreign, you know, Leonard was not a U.S. citizen, right? And he's not U.S. military. So how was he ever in control of so much power? Did you know it, that in the U.S. Navy in the 2020s, Navy officers took cash, prostitutes, LV Xiao Bao Bao, and more from a defense contractor who built the U.S. government out of tens, if not hundreds of millions. Tom Wright, the co-author of The Billion Dollar Whale, is the creator of the recent Fat Leonard podcast, which tells this uh, equal parts fascinating and horrific story. So I'm currently planning my wedding and I'm curious if you would be interested in, uh, you know, bringing some of that Joe Lowe, Fat Leonard extravagance um, on a budget, of course, to, um, uh, to my festivities this coming, this coming summer. Are you, are you actually planning a wedding? Uh, yeah, I'm getting married. Uh, I don't know how much money you have. I think you're going to need a lot if you're going to... Well, actually, first of all, Jolo's on the run in China and, and, and Leonard is in, in, in detention in San Diego, so I'm not sure they're available, but... Yeah, I guess I don't really want you. I kind of want them, but I don't want them because that would be awful and horrific. Um, the point is, the point is both these guys, Jolo, the billion dollar whale and the one MDB scandal and, and fat Leonard, Leonard Glenn Francis, the, the military contractor who, who, was, who corrupted the US Navy in Asia. The key to both of their successes was organizing unbelievable bacchanal for, for various people. In Jolo's case, uh, Hollywood celebrities and, and Goldman bankers. And in, in Leonard's case, uh, the, the, the uppermost command of the seventh fleet in, in Asia. So let's take a step back, Tom. Uh, who is Fat Leonard and how did he get involved in helping out the U.S. Navy uh, sail around Southeast Asia? So uh, Fat Leonard, I'm going to call him Fat Leonard. It's not, it's, that was what he was called. It's not what I'm calling him for people going to uh, write in and say we're being fattest. That, that's, that, that, I mean, he was 300 pounds, uh, actually over 300 pounds at one point. He um, was a husbanding agent. These are people who um, provide food, fuel, and security to U.S. Navy ships when they're, you know, not at home port. So obviously when the U.S. Navy's at San Diego or uh, Hawaii or at a permanent base, it doesn't need these people. But when it's trying to sail around to places where it's not based, you know, sometimes it will go into a government port, like in Singapore, the Singapore government organizes the port. But in many places, they need a husbanding contractor to, to do all the work they need to get the, the sewage off, to put the fresh water on, to get food for everyone. Don't forget these aircraft carriers have 5,000 people. And Leonard became the sort of m monopoly in the Pacific and Indian Oceans for this job. And he became a huge, huge operator. And he Ended up with a living in a hundred and thirty million dollar mansion with twenty luxury cars, you know, and he's he's a symbol probably more than almost anybody else of the crazy spending after September the eleventh in on defense from the U.S. So, what exactly was the Navy paying for uh, when uh, Leonard was providing his services? So, for example, you know, a, a, a sh if a ship goes into a port that that is not a government port, and Leonard Leonard's sort of doing all the work for them, they need to. They need to get the ship. The ship would have been at sea for a long time, so it has all the sewage on it. Um, they need to replenish drinking water. You know, all of that. that that's called husbanding. It's an, it's an old term from the 1800s or even earlier, which, you know, the ship needs its husband when it would go to a, a repair yard. The, re the ship repairer was called a husband. Oh, because the ship is like a female always, right? The ship is feminized, yeah, in the, in the you know, slightly misogynistic terminology of the Navy. So, so that's the old kind of fashion term for it. So Leonard came from this family that, that had done this kind of work, but for commercial ships, which is called Victualing. Um, he comes from Penang in Malaysia, a, a small island off the northwest coast of Malaysia in Southeast Asia. Um, and he, you know, he, he goes to jail as a young man for an armed robbery. He's, you know, he's a, he's a wild, wild kid. His father, who you'll learn in the podcast, is an extremely troubling, abusive. He, Leonard has an abusive childhood, basically. But um, he, ends up, he ends up sort of taking over the family business when he comes out of jail. And he builds it, he, he sort of, um, he's an incredibly good networker. You know, you referred to the parties at the beginning. He, he starts to take out the wives and, uh, of defense attache, U.S. naval attaches in Kuala Lumpur, the capital of Malaysia, he gets to know them. And he starts to win small Navy business for his family firm. And that's the beginning of a sort of wild rise that we chart in the early episodes of, of our podcast, where he, you know, it's like almost like a Jordan Belfort, Wolf of Wall Street rise. He ends up becoming 
you know, quite wealthy. And, um, you know, there's always, you know, he says there's always corruption there. But um, it, he, he sort of, sup this all gets supercharged after um, the attacks on the USS Cole uh, warship in uh, 2000 in Yemen. I don't know if your listeners are going to know about that. That's a long time ago. So what happened in 2000 in Yemen um, was Al Qaeda basically like took the equivalent of rowboats, filled them with explosive, put put them next to a navy ship, blew it up, and lots and lots of people died. And uh, you know these ships were designed uh, to fight the Soviet Union in the Arctic Sea, or not necessarily deal with um, these sort of like insurgent types attacks. And that um, that sort of changes the dynamic. Of, of of protection when you pull into these ports where all of a sudden you need to have much more sort of protection on the on the ground from for these small groups of people that may be able to do sabotage type stuff yeah that's right and so and so you know i was referring to the the mom and pops operators that did this before leonard you know the husbanding agents that were around in asia before leonard were small small operators they didn't really have the equipment and the reason was that the u.s navy had had this base in the philippines called subic bay which um it was a huge base that they could rely on down in this in that part of the world, but it shut the Philippine government shut it in the early nineties, and so that created this great opportunity for Leonard to come in and to, you know to build up other ports that the Navy could go to, including Bali, including uh, a port in Thailand called Lam Chabang, and um, you know after after the, this, the attacks on the coal in two thousand, um, the Navy was starting to require much greater security for its ships, not just on the, on the port side, but also in the sea. They didn't want a, a rerun of that attack. And of course, there were all these kind of Al-Qaeda affiliates in Southeast Asia at the time. You know, there was the Bali bombing, um, the Bali nightclub bombing, so people might remember. And so Leonard starts to provide this thing called the Ring of Steel, which were these, these steel barges that he would moor around the outside of Navy ships. And Very well branded. Very well branded. I mean, yeah, <laughs> the Ring of Steel is a tight, great title, title genius, right? And so... Um, he charged, um, you know, millions. He ended up charging hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars for that service each time a ship would come in. And so in short order, you know, Leonard is li living in an in a incredibly expensive house, you know, one of the most expensive houses in the world in Singapore and, uh, you know, has 20 luxury cars. He's the only person, apart from the Sultan of Brunei, to have a militarized Hummer in uh, Singapore, Rolls Royces in different colors, you know, and He's making all of this just out of purely out of U.S. military defense spending. So it's crazy. Can we take a little detour into these like that, like tiny little neighborhood in Singapore where all the fancy houses are? Um, have you spent a lot of time digging into that? There's a great YouTube series of like some realtor because every once in a while these guys, go, these go on sale and they like they like walk around. And, the, the, you know, there's this, there's this idea of Singapore. They have this socialized housing system and, you know, everyone sits in the different blocks and you're next to ethnic neighbors and what have you. But um, I, I do find it fascinating that that there is this kind of corner of the island, which is just carved out, letting rich people have all the fun they want. Well, uh, yeah, you're referring Singapore's, you know, is interesting because it does have a sort of, um, you know, Lee Kuan Yew, the founder, did have a, a, a sort of a Fabian socialist element to the way he, he approached things. So there's great housing for a lot of people here. You know, it's, I think it has the highest housing uh, ownership rate in the world, but, you know, in the 90%. But then you've got these areas um, of extreme wealth. And so the Gini coefficient of in, you know, inequality here is quite, is fairly high because there's so many extremely wealthy people. Um, and Leonard was, Leonard was amongst them, but he was considered, you know, so he lives in this area called Nassim Road, uh, Clooney Road. It's right by the Botanic Gardens that the British had built uh, in the colonial days. He lives in a big, eventually he lives in this huge old, what's called a good class bungalow here, which is an old, yeah. don't think of a bungalow at all, actually. It's more like a, I mean, it's a it, it, the whole thing had been, you know, redone by a very famous interior designer and architect. And it, it's an amazing, has, has beautiful lawns and multiple, you know, two swimming pools, I think, and uh, overlooking the Botanic Gardens. But he was neighbors to a guy called Ong Beng Seng. And Ong Beng Seng is one of the richest uh, men in Singapore, richest families in Singapore. They own, you know, they have uh, properties and hotel. They own the Four Seasons and uh, the Four Seasons Hotel in Singapore. And I think, I think uh, Leonard was considered nouveau riche because he sort of arrives in this, this very tony neighborhood of, of gated mansions. And, and he starts to do things like he would throw a, he's quite a religious guy. So he would throw like a, a Christmas lights uh, extravaganza on his front lawn. Uh, some people would come to see it from all over Singapore. I think you would spend like a hundred thousand Singapore dollars a year on these Christmas lights, seventy thousand US. Um, and you know his neighbors were like, "What the? Who's this guy? Who's like kind of you know 
screwing up the neighborhood. <laughs> Fair. Do you know who owns it now? I've been past it. It looks like it's empty. Um, yeah. I mean, he, in fact, he, he never owned it. So he was renting it, but he was about to buy it. So he had enough money to buy a $130 million uh, mansion. Yeah. Amazing. Back to our narrative. So uh, that letter, he's providing services which the Navy needs, um, but he's also you know, ingratiating himself with uh, Navy uh, enlisted folks, uh, officers, you know, all the way up and down the uh, all the way up and down the chain of command. Aside from making folks' professional lives easier, what sort of common threads do you see uh, in the vulnerabilities of the uh, Navy folks who ended up uh, playing ball with him? Um, I guess the, the thing that's so amazing about this is how easy it was to corrupt the Navy officers. So, you know, we've talked so far about how Leonard did a good job. And I think his reasons for talking to me um, before being sentenced, which we'll get to later, which is an incredible, you know, very unusual circumstance was that he wanted to get across his, the fact that he did a good job, right? With the ring of steel, with protecting the Navy, with having, you know, he had, had 180 boats in his flotilla that would service the Navy and no one, nobody else was around and no other, none, none other of his competitors were able to offer these services. But then what happens is in the mid 2000s with, you know, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan raging and, 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 and all these contracts coming in to, to protect and to service the fleet, he starts to build what we call a mafia network at the heart of the Seventh Fleet, and the Seventh Fleet is is the big U.S. Navy fleet based in Yokosuka in Japan. Um, it, it's the main fleet in the Pacific. It's the biggest forward deployed fleet in the U.S. Navy. And he, what he does is he focuses on all the people in that fleet who are in charge of things like ship scheduling, uh, supply contracts, those kind of things, and he just corrupts them. And the corruptibility of the of those people is 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 just fascinating to me. And you know, he corrupts them with you know. We start off by talking about dinners. Let's do a little. Let's do it. Let's do a little dialogue, Tom. Let's let's say I'm the pansy and you're not pansy. Was it Patsy? Um, let's say I'm the Patsy and you're and you're Fat Leonard. So how would you how would you sort of approach me? So you know, they actually talk about this. Like Leonard and, and one of his, his, his conspirators, a guy called Ed Arufo, talk about this in emails uh, entered into the court record. They say, we've got to get Jordan, in your case, hooked on something, right? And so they try to figure out what Jordan's interested in, right? Like, what are the things that you, you like doing? Are you into sports? Are you into... Um, and they do, this, they do this with a guy called Michael Mashevitz, um, who is this sort of American immigrant success story. He was actually like uh, taken as a child from Cambodia, from the killing fields in Cambodia and at a time of great strife and war in that country, adopted into the U by a U.S. Army uh, official and uh, ends up commanding a ship and then comes to Japan uh, on deployment. And they try to figure out what does Michael Mashevitz need? So, you know, they ply him with prostitutes and, you know, uh, fine dinners. And then they figure out, well, what he needs to do is to go back to Cambodia as the successful immigrant son. And, and he needs all these flights for his family, for his Cambodian family. And they start to just provide all of these things. So it's very sad and it's very calculated. And it's almost like, you know, Leonard says at the beginning of the podcast that his favorite movie is The Godfather. He sees himself as a Don. Yeah. Um, you know, they even refer to themselves in those terms. They say, you got it, Godfather, and, and all these kinds of things. And they, they lure in Michael Mashevitz into the conspiracy. And Mashevitz is important because... He's the schedule, deputy scheduling officer for the Seventh Fleet, so he can decide where ships go. And Leonard doesn't want ships going into Singapore where he can't, you know, it's not corrupt, it's run by the government. He needs them going into ports like, you know, Lam Chabang in Thailand that he controls, where he can fake all the invoices and start to jack up the prices to, to sort of crazy numbers. The amount of, like, toxic max masculinity on e from, like, every dimension of this story is just horrifying. Uh, the, one of the other anecdotes, which, which was um, upsetting, well, there are many, many very upsetting anecdotes in this. Um, the idea of, like, giving, both giving these people prostitutes as well as giving them bags to give to their wives and, like, using the wives as sort of bait to, like, find other folks. Well, they call it, well, they call it shaping, you know, try to give gifts to wives so they can give to their husbands to shape them to see if they're willing to come into the conspiracy. You know, we talked to people who were in the Seventh Fleet who weren't in the conspiracy and, you know, they, they're like, wow, I didn't really know this was going on. So they were, they were careful about working out whether people were willing to receive gifts. And one way they did that was to see if their spouses were willing to receive, you know, Chanel handbags or 
Gucci handbags or whatever. And some of them were Michael Mashevitz's uh, wife, Marcy Mashevitz. She's a, she's sort of a star of our podcast. She, yeah. she talks on multiple episodes and she, she was given a Gucci handbag by Michael, but she didn't know it was from Leonard. And she ends up becoming a sort of very important part of the narrative um, because she doesn't get drawn into the whole thing like some of the other Navy spouses. Yeah. Um, but, but, but just to say why this is happening, you know, for people who might be thinking, you know, the U.S. Navy, it's not everyone in the U.S. Navy, of course, but it was a big swathe of, of, of people. And I think one of the key things here is that you're away from home for a long time. You know, you're not paid as much as your buddies back home from high school who've gone into banking or whatever, you know. So there's a sense of entitlement, I think, that runs through this story, an entitlement to take those $50,000 dinners, $1,000 a plate dinners, Michelin star dinners, to take the gifts, to take the holidays. Um, it, that's really the thing that's running through all of this. It led to this deep, deep corruption in the Navy. So, Tom, I want to take you back to my, my 17-year-old self in high school. I was a big Elliot Spitzer fan. Um, the, the sort of like nerd into like local politics that I was, he was the governor of New York state, uh, who, who like had a sort of crusader vibe, um, taking down, he was a former attorney general. He like put lots of corrupt, um, politicians in jail. Uh, and then it turns out that he was, uh, paying thousands of dollars a night for, for high-class prostitutes. Um, that was very upsetting for me as a, as a young, impressionable, uh, person who cared about sort of government. And I think it sort of scarred me uh, that there are that sort of no one is clean in this in this world. And and, you know, gave me the tingles anytime anyone was sort of claiming that they were these like, you know, noble savior types. Um, I wasn't aware that uh, this was something that could happen in uh, an institution like the U U.S. Navy in, you know, going all the way into the uh, this, the, the, the Obama era. How much should should one index on the Fat Leonard story? about, uh, you know, Navy culture and, and what, uh, what the institution really stands for. Well, one of the great, uh, one of the big themes running through our podcast is, is the misogyny, the huge misogyny problem in the Navy. And we go back to, in episode three, we go back to the tailhook scandal in 19, uh, 1991, I think, which was when women were um, sexually abused at a, at a Las Vegas convention for the tailhook was the, is the hook on, the, on, a, on a ship that stops the... Um, uh, plane when the plane lands it stops it falling into the sea basically and so it was naval aviators and they just won the gulf war first gulf war there was this air, uh, jubilation a bunch of the 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 air aviators who'd been captured by Saddam Hussein and then released were there at this convention everyone gets drunk and then upstairs you know uh, the women and this is at the time when women were first starting to fight in 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 the, the military you know they'd been in the military but they were actually on fighting vessels and that um in that in that war and they were they were sort of groped and 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 manhandled down down this corridor and it ended up becoming a big scandal but nobody nobody gets punished for it in in the navy and that's the you know we use that because to understand what's going on in the navy in this story and the fact that not it's not just you know junior officers that are sleeping with prostitutes put on by leonard it's admirals and, and i love how the admirals tom they say Oh, I didn't know they were prostitutes. They just thought I was handsome. They seemed really educated. Like the the amount of like I don't know willful disillusion, like ego. Um, that well, they don't even admit. They don't even admit that they slept with prostitutes. You know that 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 thing you're referring to is like I did, if I if they were prostitutes, they didn't present them to me as such. I mean, that's just a it's a rhetorical thing. But but um. The the key here is not sleeping with prostitutes, right? I mean, yeah. people have their own. People have their own moral compasses, right? I'm definitely not, what would you call it, a blue stocking or whatever. I, I mean, people, is it surprising to people who listen to this podcast that Navy seamen go to bed with prostitutes? Absolutely not. That is like, that's what's happened since the beginning of time. But what's going on here is it's becoming like institutionalized and, and it's the contractor that's organizing the prostitutes. The guy who's making hundreds of millions of dollars in revenues off of defense spending. You know, don't forget defense spending went to, you know, it currently still is seven hundred billion dollars in the U.S. Right? It's got it went up a lot since the first Gulf War. It was like it backed down two or three. I mean, I know as a percentage of GDP, it hasn't gone up as much, but it was you know it's doubled since before the first Gulf War. Um, and Leonard's making all this money, and one of the keys to him winning the contracts is he's putting on uh, all these all these. Sometimes it's single prostitutes. Sometimes he's organizing orgies. You know, the podcast begins with him organizing an orgy in the Manila Hotel where Douglas MacArthur had, had, had been during the Second World War, 
famous general. And there's also a huge, I mean, not only is it, is it a culture of misogyny in the Navy, how, how are women going to fit in with a culture where this is happening with senior officers? Yeah. It's also a massive national security risk because, you know, it turns out in the course of our reporting that we found out that Leonard was putting secret cameras into the karaoke machines in these, in these suites of these hotels and recording these orgies. And so, um, and, you know, we also found out from a very, very good source that China, China has control of that sexual compromat now. Uh, or some of it. And so mash, not only a, a story of misogyny in the Navy, and also, also a story of how all these officers involved in this story forgot all their training about being turned by a foreign, you know, Leonard was not a U.S. citizen, right? And he's not U.S. military. So how was he ever in control of so much power? You know, he, he's, he's, he can decide where w warships go because he's corrupted the supply guys and the, and the scheduling guys. And then he's got all this kind of leverage on them from all the sexual antics that everyone got up to. So let's take the story forward a little bit, Tom. How does the, the, the Navy and then ultimately DOJ and the, and the FBI uh, start to, to wrap this up? And what has been the Navy's response to all the dirty laundry, which has been aired over the past few years? So this, this, you, you may, if you're listening to this, and, and you know, this is the, a world that we're peeling back the curtain on, right? People don't really know about this world. You're probably thinking, well, how the hell did this continue for so long? How is this guy ripping off the U.S. Navy for so long? Part of the reason is that people did make complaints. We, we talked to a whistleblower called David Schaus in one of the episodes, and he, he's in Hong Kong, and he complains about, you know, these high costs. Why is Leonard charging for 40,000 liters of fresh water when the boat can only take half of that or whatever it is, right? Um, and they get ignored. The, 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 they make complaints to the NCIS, which is the naval investigative body, you know, famous because of the TV show with uh, LL Cool J, right? And um, the, none of these NCIS investigations go anywhere. And one of the reasons is that Leonard is doing such a good job. You know, we talked about the Ring of Steel. We talked about all these boats he had. No one, no one could really replicate what he was doing. Um, and also everyone's getting laid and, and having dinners and parties in every port and by the way, Leonard's also got a warship called the Braveheart, which he bought from, it was an old British warship that he buys. He even uses that to, to, to fuel Marines on missions to fight Al-Qaeda in the Philippines. So he's doing this great job and the NCIS investigations all get ignored. And we never really understood because Leonard got arrested, okay, in 2013 in San Diego. But the Navy has never really explained the, what happened because it's such an embarrassment, this whole story. But we were able to understand through our reporting the sequence of events that led to Lennon's arrest. Um, so, you know, the NCIS f ignores these investigations for so many years. But then Marcy Mashevitz, uh, who we referred to earlier, the wife of, of Commander Michael Mashevitz, who'd been corrupted by Leonard, the, Michael ends up uh, abusing her, pushing her up the stairs. She has a bruise. She ends up taking it to the Seventh Fleet Command, and, and Michael's put on the ship to prevent, you know, to keep him away from the family, which is living on a on, in a house on the base there in Japan. And eventually, she gets sick of of she she knows Michael's uh, has a, has having affairs that he's hanging out with Leonard. He even sort of takes his their, their four children, some of their four children, to to parties with Leonard, not parties, but dinners with Leonard, and. She and Marcy ends up going to the NCIS with her concerns about her husband. And then she talks about the gift, the Gucci handbag that she got. She talks about, she hands over emails, credit card statements, all this kind of thing. And they start looking into Michael Mashevitz, the NCIS does finally. And they start to see his, his, they look at his Gmail account, not just his formal Navy account. And they see that he's doing all this sort of dodgy dealings with Leonard, including, you know, Michael's in, in charge of ship movements or can help. Uh, change the movements of ships. And so he's helping Leonard get ships to, to ports that Leonard controls. And that's really, the, by, the point, by that point, this is already on, this is already in, at Washington at the, you know, the level of, oh, sorry, at um, Quantico, at the level of N NCIS headquarters. And this investigation ends up getting sort of an unstoppable momentum um, that Leonard can't control anymore. Hi, I'm Callum Quinn, China Talks editor. I clean up these shows so you don't have to hear all Jordan's attempts to pronounce people's names correctly. Help pay my salary and get an ad-free feed for your trouble by subscribing to China Talk. Links in the show notes. And don't forget, we also have a sub stack where you can find transcripts of episodes as well as guest posts from experts and translations of Chinese media coverage of international events. Link also in the show notes. Tom, have you read Red Roulette? I have. Wonderful. Okay. So how would you compare and contrast uh, Fat Leonard and the uh, Red Roulette protagonist? 
So, I mean, the Red Roulette, I mean, I'm, I'm not a Chinese speaker, but the Red Roulette protagonist you're referring to is... is Desmond Shum. Des, Desmond Shum and his, mainly yeah. his wife who, you know, they were, they were effectively bag men and women for uh, Wen Zhao, Prime Minister of China, Wen Bao and his wife, right? Uh, the Prime Minister's wife. And, you know, that, that was in some ways, uh, I, I picked up the book, you know, I'd read all of um, David Bobo's coverage in the New York Times and I, I knew about the corruption and Wen Bao's corruption and the fact that it had gotten you know, the times in trouble in China and, and foreign journalists sort of blocked there. But I was shocked by the detail in that book of how the life of a bag man and a bag woman for, for a major head of state, how it works. And it was such a great book because, you know, if, you, if you're not a China expert like me, you read a lot of China books and, and they don't have that level of inside the room that that book had. Yeah. Um, you know, I have questions about, you know, at the end he talks about he, he he moved to America because he wanted he believes in democracy and you you do end up feeling well it's a little bit late for that <laughs> but but um, if you compare it to Leonard uh, I'd say it's different um, let Leonard you know Leonard definitely did a good job in some ways right he did he did provide a lot of things the Navy needed to operate and made it easy for the Navy to operate for a long time. So, for example, the Navy wants to go to Chennai in India. They want, they want to have the first ever uh, aircraft carrier visit to an Indian port, and they can't really find anyone in India that, that, that's up to their standards. And so Leonard sails all these ships across from Singapore, you know, a distance of like New York City to, to Denver, Colorado, and, and protects the ships and, and, and brings all the, the things they need. And he ends up charging $5 million. So that's the ripoff part, right? But he's doing a real job. Whereas in the case of Red Roulette, I mean, I wasn't, you know, they, they're building, they build that interest, they build that sort of city that they're planning to do and all this. But I'm not really, I'm not really sure of where the economic or business good is in the Red Roulette story. Yeah. If you get what I'm saying. Do, I mean, do you the, know what I mean? The other, my other sort of comparison is that like Desmond, at some point he realizes that this is all stupid and fake. And that this is just like actually a kind of gross game. And the way he frames it, at least, is that he kind of wanted to go clean and just like be able to like be a businessman and like do private equity shit. Um, Fat Leonard seems like a psychopath um, who clearly had this like very traumatic childhood, which he's keeping with him. And, you know, he's doing horrible things to his his uh, former uh, the, the, the parents of his children. And while well, the other hand, I think Desmond like actually sort of knows how to relate to human beings in a, in a somewhat more healthy way, uh, which, which was, uh, which was, which was my, um, which was my big takeaway. But I think, sorry. No, no, of course that's true. So, so I mean, the, the big, di the, the big difference is that Desmond Shum's written a tell all book about the utter corruption at the heart of, of the Chinese political system, which is incredibly useful to everyone who's read it yeah. because who else is in a position to do that? I mean, it's, it's a, it's a fascinating book. I mean, when I went to buy it in Singapore, it was like there was so many copies on reserve in Kinokuni <laughs> that people wanted to buy it, right? And I think I read it like as soon as it came out because I was so fascinated by it. But um, he's playing a service by, t and it, 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 I, I imagine quite large personal risk um, to tell the story. And so, it, yes, it's amazing. And Leonard, of course. So, so why is Len why did Leonard decide, agree to talk to me? You know, Leonard Leonard was arrested in 2013 in a sting in San Diego. Um, they pretended they were calling him in to discuss more contracts and they, they ended up arresting him in the Marriott Hotel in San Diego eight years ago. And he's been cooperating ever since with the government as a, as a star witness in the case of all the other Navy officers who were corrupted by him, who are, who are still ongoing. And a bunch of those, six of those are going to trial in, in February because they've pleaded not guilty. So Leonard has no guilt at all. He, 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 talking to me is not really, I mean, it is a tell-all in the sense that he admits to all the corruption in the same way that Desmond Shum writes about the corruption in, in his book. Yeah. But where, whereas Desmond Shum is sort of saying, well, you know, it was all terrible and, and this is just bad. Leonard, is, Leonard sort of tries to spin it that, well, I did a great job. This corruption is necessary to get anything happening. And, and he's sort of, you know, um, it's not a mere culpa at all. But it's, ama but, you know, it's amazing that he decided to talk, Leonard, for this podcast because... It's not good for him. He's not, he has not yet been sentenced. Yeah. He, it, the government will be very angry with him now this podcast has come out. And, 
you know, he's, oh, by the way, he's got, um, he's got uh, kidney cancer. So that's another reason that he may have decided to talk that he's sort of, he, he's not in good health. And, and so he threw caution to the wind to, to do the podcast. Um, what was sort of but, your like emotional valence over the course of doing these interviews? Well, you know, Leonard is a, is a fa fa fascinating character. He's, he's very charming on some levels, you know, when you're talking to him. And so as you listen to the podcast, you'll be charmed by him. I think at some point you'll, you'll sort of almost be rooting for him when he, like this Wolf of Wall Street, like rise that he has earlier on in the series. I, I wasn't no, rooting for him, Tom. You weren't rooting. Really, maybe not. <laughs> I mean, I, it's, it's, yes, it's at least, okay. The, I think, I think what you could say is at least you don't hate him at the early stages. But what happened to me was in my you know 25 hours of talking to him on, like we're talking now on this Riverside product here, uh, we did a very similar thing. He recorded, I, we, we sort of smuggled in a microphone. He's out on, on home, home detention because he has cancer. So we smuggled in his microphone, he set it up and we talked. As I did my own research about him, you know, it's obviously we don't allow him just to talk and tell his story, but everything was sort of second sourced um, or worked out against reality. And he, uh, you know, I started to find out things about his personal cruelties to women, including the mother of his children, um, Marcy Mashevitz as well. And I started to, you know, really have problem with this guy and his, you know, he talks very openly in a misogynistic way. He talks about how the mother of his child was just a mistress who he fired. You know, he uses language like that. It all goes back to his own extremely abusive childhood. And, and, you know, I had to sort of just keep the interviews going, even though I was you know, personally troubled by my, my, um, what I was learning about him as we were going ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, so I did a show with, uh, uh, Lizzie and Mike Forsyth kind of as a little book club talking about, um, Red Roulette. And one point that Mike made was just that Chinese journalists, if they were allowed to dig around the amount of stuff that the, the amount of, you know, comparable stories that they would be able to find, um, you know, not just in the PLA, of course, but like across the entire system would just be horrifying. And, it, and it's fascinating, right? Because you get these little glimpses every once in a while, um, you know, over the course of the anti-corruption campaign in particular, you had uh, these, these short trials. And sometimes people would say, like, you, you know, sometimes there would be some incentive within the system to like show the 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 fridge full of cash or like have some sort of salacious details. Um, but you would never you know, get the, get the, like, what does this mean about the institution and, and, and how did this one person, how was this one person able to be, you know, this corrupt and get all this money in the, in, in the first place. Right. So, you know, it, it's interesting thinking about to what extent this is, uh, you, you know, yeah, but clearly this is not only something that's happening in, in, in America and, and it almost certainly is even, is even more, uh, gross. Uh, you know, we just had Peng Shui. Uh, right. A, uh, no, the number four in the, on the state council, uh, is, is, is pressuring, uh, tennis stars to sleep with, um, to sleep with him. So, you know, yeah, no, I think, I think, okay. So, I mean, the, China clearly, I mean, I, I, I lived in Hong Kong for a bunch of years, but I'm no China expert. I don't speak Chinese and I, you know, I don't pretend to know what's going on in the mainland. I think it's just a black box for so many people, but Mike Forsyth is, it would be close of all the people watching China and knowing about corruption, he's the one who really does the, the hard yards, you know, looking at the gravestones to find who owns what on family characters and all that kind of amazing work they do at the New York Times. Uh, and that great story they did last year proving that, um, uh, I think the number two in the, the party had a family had houses down on in uh, Stanley in Hong Kong, yeah. you know, riverfront, multi, multi-million dollar houses and all this kind of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, the corruption in China is obviously not, you know, it's well known. It's very, very deep. My, my personal knowledge of it is that, you know, Joe Lowe, the, the fraudster at the center of the 1MDB scandal, when he, was, when he was on the run, you know, where is he living now? Well, he's living in China. And the reason is that he's, you know, he's, he, he went there after he was exposed in newspaper articles and uh, was given some level of protection by a guy called Sun Li Jun. And Sun Li Jun was the head of the domestic security forces in China at the time, a pretty, you know, I think a vice minister level. And Sun and Jolo got involved in, in corrupt Belt and Road deals in Malaysia. And it was an attempt to, to pad these, these rail contracts in Malaysia um, and fill the holes from the earlier frauds. And, you know, Sun Li Jun was going to make his money. Now, we know about this because somebody on the Malaysian side of this uh, took minutes of a meeting in Beijing in 2016, where they discuss all these corrupt Belt and Road deals they're going to do. And they discuss it in very bold terms. You know, they say, well, we should need to 
jack up the price here and make it look commercial over here and we'll take the money from this. And, it, it, you know, until today, I think it's one of the clearest sort of examples of corruption in the, in the Belt and Road. And if people don't know what that is, that's like, you know, China cool. building rail and road overseas. You know, we got hold of those minutes because when the prime minister of Malaysia lost his position and the opposition came in, they, they got those minutes and somebody leaked them to us. And subsequently, Sun Li Jun, Jolo's protector in China, has, has been arrested for corruption by, by the Xi Jinping administration. Um, and, and, you know, I think recently he was kicked out of the Communist Party and he's like, I don't know, I imagine he's going to be punished pretty severely. But it's just that in China, I think, you know, is, are these anti-corruption drives real? I don't think so. You know, this is just somebody got caught and, you know, gets publicized. But Jolo still hasn't been returned to face justice in America or, or, or Malaysia. So, so there were two dynamics of the uh, response by the Navy. First... You have this um, you have this dynamic of different spanks for different ranks um, where the more junior folks um, who were, uh, you know, to, to a greater or lesser extent involved with Fat Leonard um, ended up going to jail and more senior folks, you know, got kind of letters in their system or whatever, were, were able to retire with um, full retirement benefits and, and, and so on. Also, you had this like just broader lack of a reckoning it seems for um for what ended up happening. So, um slightly facetiously Tom, does uh does the US government need an anti-corruption drive? Well, look, I mean let's just say I don't I don't in any way believe that the US US system is as corrupt as the Chinese system. That would be my my view. But yes, I mean I'm a journalist. I believe that you need to let in sunlight, you know, to for things to get better. And the US Navy clearly has a, a corruption problem. Um is everyone in the US Navy corrupt? No. That's not what we're saying, but Leonard was telling me throughout this whole, you know, 25 hours of talking, he kept saying, of course, it's corrupt. And look, by the way, the person who took over my contracts, uh, a company called MLS, is also corrupt. And I sort of discounted it. I had no, I had no time to go investigate that. I wasn't going to use that in the podcast. And, you know, how do you check? You know, it would have been a whole new investigation. I would have to open up into a different company that was currently still doing that. And then, you know, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, the, uh, there's an indictment for the arrest of the CEO of MLS, unsealed from, the, from, from Washington. And uh, that guy's now been arrested, turned himself in and he's been arrested. And so, and, and it looks just like the Fat Leonard scandal. You know, it involves uh, uh, officials taking bribes, over invoicing, charging too much for his services, Navy officials taking backhanders. And so it happens. Is it everyone in the Navy? No, but again, it's happening and it's, it's, a, it's a problem. And the other problem is you, you alluded to is that after Leonard was arrested, okay, so 30 people, more or less 30 Navy officers, a few, uh, uh, almost 30 Navy officers have been indicted, right? Some of them pled guilty and went to jail. Others trials, as I said, are coming up in the ones who've pleaded not guilty. This, I think it's six now who have pleaded not guilty. They're going to, to trial in February with Leonard as, as the star witness after which he'll be sentenced, right? So this has gone on and on and on. And meanwhile, all the admirals that were involved with Leonard, the four stars, admirals, the top, top people in the fleet, you know, people who were commanding all military in the Pacific for the, for the U.S., you know, Leonard told investigators these people slept with prostitutes that he put on and this kind of thing and took gifts and they weren't punished. And some, some admirals who were punished, you know, they just got what are called censure letters, which are, you know, basically slaps on the wrist for official and in, in our final episode, which we call different spanks for different ranks, which is that term for you know, obviously more senior people get let off. We, we, we compare a guy who's just got out of jail, a commander who just got out of jail for his dalliances with Leonard, who, when he talks to us for the first time, you know, since getting out of jail, to, to an admiral who's still very senior in the sort of Republican Party. He's a, a China hawk. And we compare what they did. And, it, you know, the commander's furious because he looks at the admiral and he thinks, well, I didn't, what he did was very similar to what I did. And he didn't, nothing happened to him. He's like currently... Very senior in Washington policy circles. And let's do that. What's his name? And who does he work for now? Oh, so, so, the, so the, the admiral we're talking about is called Mark Montgomery. Um, so he was, he was Mark Montgomery uh, is now head of the um, a Cyber Security Commission. And he works, for a, he works for a Washington conservative think tank. So he was reprimanded by the Navy in 2018 um, by the Navy secretary with what's called a letter of censure, which says, you know, he, the, it alleges that he improperly uh, intervened to, to make sure that two Navy ships took fuel from Leonard um, when they had turned it down. 
And then Leonard on, on, on our podcast says, look, this is extremely valuable to me because this is, you know, this was, some, this is what was a place where I made money was selling fuel. You know, not Leonard was obviously always overcharging. Uh, sorry, the, the, the sense letter also said, you know, you took, you took dinners from Leonard costing $35,000, you uh, free hotel rooms for your family and all of this. And Montgomery responded to me for the podcast saying, well, I admit to my mistakes, but as I responded to the, to the Navy, some of the other allegations were not backed up, but then he wasn't specific in his response to me about exactly what, what he thought was not backed up. And then David Capown, who is the commander who's just got out of jail in Hawaii for 18, he spent 18 months in jail. He was indicted. Um, he had in his plea deal, it talks all about the prostitution, you know, the fact that he took prostitutes from Leonard in Singapore and all of this, which was embarrassing to him. And he ends up doing 18 months in jail for failing to, on a technicality, basically, he, had, he pleads guilty to failing to mention Leonard on a security form. But he's like, you know, he's, he and many of the other people who pleaded guilty early on are really angry because they're looking, they're looking back on what they did and they're wishing they hadn't pleaded guilty because, you know, it doesn't look like senior, most ranks of the Navy are getting into any, any serious trouble. Tom, let's talk a little bit about your career. Um, jumping away from a cushy job in a legacy journalism media to start your own thing is not scary. I mean, presumably a billion dollar whale sold well, but I don't think it necessarily sold well enough to like uh, allow you to sit on a beach for the rest of your life. Um, what was your thinking? Uh, uh, talk a little bit about whale hunting, your new, or your new venture and, and you know, how you've, uh, how you've ran this show and, and what you're thinking about doing for the next few years. Yeah, that's, it's funny. A lot of, a lot of my former colleagues think that, you know, you make so much money selling a bestselling. I mean, our book was a New York, New York Times bestseller, but yeah, you don't, it, it doesn't change your life in terms of, if, if you imagine like how much work you have to put into, to doing a book like that and, and it being that successful, you know, if that was a, if you were a banker and you did a banking deal of such difficulty, you, you know, that would be your pay, your, your payday for life. But no, it doesn't work like that. Um, obviously you don't, you don't make the lion's share of, of, but, but it did definitely, okay, it did give us enough, you know, Bradley and I left the journal. It gave us enough, a little bit of a cushion and a passive income that means you can sort of take a bit of a risk, I guess. And so Bradley and I worked together at the journal. We just, we wrote Billion Dollar Well together. And then we decided to um, set up Project Brazen earlier this year in February. And Project Brazen is a, is a company that's, that's doing, you know, true stories via either, you know, podcasts, articles, documentaries, books. With the, with the goal, with the stories that are focusing on stories that are adaptable into TV shows and films. So that's what we're doing. Um, you know, we've raised a bit of money to, um, to, to sort of fund it. We've raised a content fund, which we're going to deploy to sort of create IP, to buy IP. Um, and we've got, a, we've got a bunch of things, a really exciting slate of, of projects in the works. Um, I'm based in Singapore. The company's based here in Bradley's in London. It is, I mean, you know, it is. I'm in my mid forties, so it's a time to, to take a risk in life, I guess. And, um, uh, we think there's a great opportunity for it because there's such a boom in the, the demand for nonfiction content, right? There's all these streamers, all these different platforms all competing with each other. Everyone wants true stories. So, um, you know, we're working very closely with a company called SK global, which is making crazy, uh, which is turning, they made crazy rich Asians and they're turning billion dollar whale into a, into a TV show. Um, and so that we're working on that. And yeah, we're, we're, we're really excited. It's, it's, a, it's a great new venture for us. All right, Tom. Uh, I don't think Hollywood's made a sort of mean movie showing the like dark side of China um, that isn't like a one-person documentary in decades now. Um, but uh, we've had a number of ideas come up over the course of recording these past 200 China Talk episodes. My two favorite are The Death of Mao. Uh, so you do sort of like 75 to maybe 78 and you have like John Ching and the gang of four and like that mess. And you sort of turn it into like a death of Stalin, like dark comedy. Um, the other one is the, the Bo Lai saga, which is just the absolutely craziest thing. And, uh, you know, deserves a Sopranos like treatment. How can I get you to make them? Uh, absolutely no chance to either of them. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think, you know, um, one of the, one of the, I mean, there's, there's, there's a couple of reasons why I wouldn't make either of those myself. I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not a, I'm not a, it's not as if I've been working in Hollywood all my life, but I think 
you need stories that w what we're looking for are stories that are absolutely globally applicable. So you can, so somebody, if you think about Fat Leonard, right, it can, it could be, it's, we're actually seeing it in the downloads of our podcast. It's downloading uh, very well in Malaysia, in Australia, in Singapore. It was like we were top of the charts in Singapore, small market, but you know, and then it's doing very well in the US and in the UK, right? And so we're hitting all these different markets. And that's really the, that's the key to business success, we believe, for Project Brazen is to do, to do, focus on stories which can sell. Everyone's talking about in, in Hollywood about how do you do the next money heist? You know, how do you do the next Squid Games? And neither of those things were programmed to be globally successful. But is it possible to think about true stories from a way, in a way that, you know, you are hoping that that happens. And if you think about it, like, um, you know, you're a China hand, you're a China speaker, your audience, China hands that, you know, the gang of four or Bo Xilai are not stories that are going to be very easy to, but Bo, Bo Xilai per perhaps a little bit more because you've got the whole, was he called Neil Haywood? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, he's, I guess he's your, he's your sort of entry point, right? Yeah. And he was, perhaps he was a spy. Perhaps he wasn't. He worked for Hacklet, right? Um, you know, the, the Bo Shilai's wife's a fascinating character. Actually, it connects to the Desmond Shum. There's a part of the, the part of the Desmond Shum book that really struck me was where he says, oh, is it possible that Bo Shilai was the source of, of, of the leaks to the New York Times about Wen Chao Bao, which just strikes me as like absolutely preposterous. But Mike was like, that's offensive. I do my own work. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Well, which is why I said, you know, like, you know, uh, alarm bells went off when I read that. Cause I'm like, what? It doesn't strike me that that's true. Um, you know, there's the other issue that uh, I heard the other day that, you know, normally there are 37, 38, uh, licenses given to foreign films into China every year. And this year only 17 have been granted. Um, and so it's getting harder and harder and harder to get, uh, to get stuff into, to get Hollywood films to China. And, you know, the Bo Xi life story, if it was going to be popular anywhere, <laughs> would be popular in China, right? <laughs> you know, it's not huge no in China. Um, but no one's ever going to see it if you make it. Yeah. So that's the problem. Uh, I, I mean, it's really interesting, right? Because like Netflix in particular, they are almost certainly never going to have a competitive mainland product. And they have made some really interesting Taiwanese movies, um, which, you know, aren't, you know, are, 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 are dark, are exploring sort of like, you know, uh, tricky parts of, of, of Taiwanese history. But none of those have have risen to the level of like, you know, that Brad Pitt movie in the early 2000s where, you know, he's like saving Tibet uh, back in the you know 90s and early 2000s. There was there was there were a number of of Western made movies that portrayed the CCP in a really um, in a really poor light. And I wonder if things get worse, if Netflix might end up um, or, or, you know, if there's because I feel like that's that's really the only studio that doesn't have any real sort of like downside risk if that's up if at a certain point they just decide to write off china entirely um i think it's just getting harder and harder i mean you know, i talked to movie executives just trying to get movies in like you know the, the big tentpole movies june or whatever right it's like even then you have to you have to be careful and like i said only 17 movies made it this year i think i think disney have no movies in china this year or something and then obviously the the battle at lake changjin has broken all box office records and you know and and it's about is is not the film that's about sort oh. of the the North Korean War. I'm not trying to sell my movie in China. I don't think that. I I, I think that's <laughs> yeah. That that game is a little far. I mean, it's really funny, right? Because like the legend of of Shang Chi, uh, the Disney movie, which is the the Marvel movie, which is half in Chinese, is still not is still not being aired. But right, right, and I, I, part part of it part of its censorship, part of its taste. I mean, Crazy Rich Asians did get into China and then didn't didn't do that well, I think. And so, I don't know. I mean. People have different tastes, right? But yeah. clearly, it's just very hard to get into China. And then, so no, but I mean, I know you're not you're not pitching it for China. But the point is, you know, if you're not, if it's about China, that's your biggest yeah. market. You got like, yeah. You know, over well, I mean, it's funny, right? Because like House of Cards was a huge hit in mainland China, and even even the um uh, even like a handful of Chinese officials or like the I think the U.S. like the the ambassador to the U.S. was like, I love this show, like it's so great. Uh, and you can only imagine. Uh, you know, I shouldn't be the one to write this. Some Tyson journalist should be the one to write it. But those, but those were different times, weren't they? Yeah, in China. That's fair. Um. Anyways, uh, maybe 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 I'll put on a play. I'll 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 I'll, I'll, I'll give you tickets, Tom. Um. <laughs> last thing, publishing a podcast without being on a broader network. 
uh, and having it go to number one on the charts is not a straightforward thing to do. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, uh, or I'm just curious, like what was the sort of growth trajectory, who was interested in this and how it, um, uh, how it, uh, ended up getting, uh, momentum over time. Oh, I pity my poor friends on social media and, uh, Facebook because yeah, so we didn't, we, we had to publicize it ourselves a lot. Right. And, um, the reason is we didn't partner with anybody, well, we partnered with PRX who, who are this great platform that, you know, this is where this American life has a home. Um, and so you'll see on our posters, it's, it's Project Brazen and PRX. And, you know, we didn't want to, because our, our model is to, to turn what we're doing into TV shows or films or, or, or docu-series, you know, we, it's very important for us to control the intellectual property. Um, and if you go to, you know, other, some of the other people, you can like Apple or, or Spotify or even Wondery, you know, you're going to give up quite a lot of your IP. Um, and so what we're trying to do is self-finance you know we took we took debt to do this and and uh you know we but we control 100 percent of the ip but what that means is you know there are i think there are like two million podcasts or something some crazy number of podcasts out there so to get any visibility you know it's difficult and especially when you know apple are not putting you up there as new and noteworthy or calling you podcast of the year or whatever because you're not you know you're sort of an independent and the one way that we've gotten uh, notices, well, I think first of all, it sounds arrogant, but I think it's like a good story and it's, it's interesting to listen to. So it's got, there's a word of mouth element to it, but also it's, it's real time, right? Like a lot of, a lot of podcasts are sort of set in the past or they have, it's about a murder from some time in the past you have to really persuade someone to listen to it because it's a good story. Whereas this one, you know, we're getting coverage in, you know, we're on the front page of the uh, LA times the other day, San Diego Tribune. Um, we were on like CBS evening news at prime time, because this is like a, this is a real time look at something that's still going on. The trials are still going on. Leonard still hasn't been sentenced. It's a, it's a cover up at the Navy. And so it creates some like, almost like free marketing and, um, that, that helps sure. And then, you know, we we get onto podcasts like yours and, and, and other shows. And so the, the word of mouth is building for sure, but it's definitely, it's definitely hard work because there are just so many podcasts out there, you know? Tom, I hear you take pitches. Yeah, I mean, we're we're super open to anyone who's got a great story that they think um, the world needs to hear. The stories we're looking for are global, but you know, rooted in a in a place, but also you know, with global appeal. Doesn't mean there has to be. You know, the old days, you're always told as a journalist, "What does the reader in Idaho or Kentucky think about it?" We don't. We think that's old fashioned now. You know, it doesn't have to be like that, but it has to have themes that are resonant will resonate globally um yeah but we're we we are open to ideas and we've we've you know we've got funding to fund projects so uh yeah come ahead if you have a great story and so what is the how does that work oh well we we will um help people get things made yeah all right tom let's stay in touch uh and uh tom's on twitter at uh tom right asia best continent uh at, at the end of every show i let my guests pick the outro music um any song you think fits with the project brazen uh outlook on the world so i have this um so jolo actually um maybe i should send it to you if i can find it but he actually recorded a song with little john and others in the early 2000s where oh it's ne it was never released but he paid for it to happen and his his um his role in the song is to go very hot very very hot oh my god yeah is that so we could get you that to you there's 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 also a song from the movie uh it's called 22 jump street yeah where there's this line jolo i see you jolo uh drinking miso at a party with leo never solo referring to how leonardo dicaprio would turn up at jolo's parties <laughs> so i think if there's a song that sort of encapsulates this whole corruption of the early and, and and the leonard story is the fact leonard story is the same time frame right we're talking about the 2000 the aught the aughts right um anything by lmfao or or pitbull you know that's the period cheesy cheesy dance anthems that's that captures a lot of what's going on here. tom right thanks so much for being a part of China. thank you i enjoyed it
great love. Hands up! Hands up! Hey! Hands up! Hands up! Oh! Hands up! Oh! Hands up! 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 Hands up!